title of this show, which is a, a survey show, but a very particular journey through my work, is called Body Double. And um, in selecting from 25 or more years practice, you know, within a certain limited space, uh, the curator Victoria Lynn and I had to sort of come up with a concept and then work through that to, to, to select works that in installing them together would curate a kind of story or, or create a sort of story through the work. Um, I also felt it was very important in those discussions with Victoria that the very first work, which is owned by the MCA, a first installation work of mine called Disclosures, um, would be in the show because I think has been, it's evident from that work there's a lot of references to my practice after that. So I thought that that should be in the show and we're also very keen that there should be a very recent work. Um, so the work Body Double, which became the title of the show, uh, was a work that I made both for the MCA and the Auckland Triennial. It was seen in Auckland first but just a few months before the MCA show opened and um, I feel that's a really good experience for people to see a most recent work because it gives you a sense of where I might be going with the work um, and it also allows that work to relate to the very first work I ever made. So I think, you know, a survey gives you an opportunity to do things like that. So in a certain sense, that created a parenthesis for the show and then we sort of had to think about, with many, many discussions, which works would be included between those two first and last works. And the, the theme of the body double seemed to become, you know, we didn't just select it like that. We kept playing with the idea of it. And as we began to choose works and exclude works, try and find how that term might resonate. Not be over prescriptive, because I think that's important. Um, it doesn't explain the whole show because it's called body double, but it becomes a kind of nice parallel thought as you move through the show. This work's called Disclosures. It's the first work I ever made. And um, it was installed in a space that basically was like, like a blind space like this and just had an entrance onto the street. And what they've done at the MCA is set the screens up to my specifications as it used to be, just to try and reenact a little bit the feeling of how people would have originally entered the space. Because it, when you come in, you've got to make a decision whether you'll go through that one or that one. And that's fairly important because when you look around this room, all the photos, there's verticals hanging opposite horizontals in two separate rows. And that's a structural part of the work because when I did this piece, if you look into the horizontal photos, you'll see in all cases where you can see the tripod, there's a camera on the tripod. And if you look at the vertical photos, which are mostly of me in semi-dressed state, um, there's a camera around my neck. And what I did was it came out of the idea that when you're taking, when you're being the subject of a photo, the model for a photo if you like, what the camera does is take the picture of you, but in fact you're looking out at a different kind of picture which is the view you're looking at and that that isn't really taken into account. And it came from that sort of simple, if you like, dilemma. Um, so what I did was set off those two cameras, the one on the tripod in the room and the one around my neck at the same time. And so at the same time I recorded my own view of the room while the camera took a picture of me. And the idea of the sort of nudity in it is it's a kind of ruse because it's sort of like, you know, the shot of the woman, the naked woman. Um, and so people come in and they're consuming a certain type of stereotype in relation to that. But most people when I did this show first up, as they moved down the corridors, became aware that in every single picture there was a camera, either it was around my neck or in the room on the horizontal view. And so the device of this is that they are actually being looked at by two cameras. And so the structure of the room is really crucial. Um, it's an installation, it's not a photographic show in that sense. It's, if you like, a show about photography and what photography does to a subject, etc. It's about voyeurism and so on and so forth. So, so the form of it's really important. In all the black and white photos, the things that appear around the wall as colour images, because in a certain sense they're the conventional part, they're on the wall, they're kind of quite beautiful in a certain sense, they're colour. 
um, they're what we expect of an image on the wall, a photographic image on the wall. When you look at them in the black and white photos, which have a kind of documentary feel because they're black and white, all those images appear. They're sort of, in lots of cases, they're the props that occur in the photos in my studio. So what you're looking at is a kind of idea of the work when it arrives in a gallery or a museum. And what you're looking at in the black and white as well as all that stuff I talked about, voyeurism and the two camera views, you're also looking into a relatively intimate space. You're looking into the studio environment where the work is actually made. So there's a double function going on between, you know, as I say, the work presented on the wall as, a, as an artwork and, if you like, the process. So it's quite a complex work, this one. Um, and as you go through, all those photos, there's this game going on and you'll pick them up, like for example the face behind with the plastic is actually on the walls of my studio. The burning face is, you know, in the photos too. So, and there's also, they run in a sequence and they end, if you look at it, in this room where there's just chaos everywhere. So there's also a kind of little, you know, melodramatic narrative going on as a sort of spoofy thing too. The most recent work in the show is called Body Double um, and it in a sense resonates a lot with this very first work and I mean you don't know that when you make it it's like a retrospective understanding if you like. That work's composed again using rubber and again using myself but in this instance full body casts of me that two poses exactly the same one face up one face down. In some ways it's a very simple work but I think quite an evocative work because what I, on that occasion I worked with two other people, two dancers, a male and a female, and just through projection they occupy, or they're projected onto my form and they roll in and out of the forms. But I think probably the spooky part of that work is because again I'm working with that material, the rubber material, which is such a direct cast from me, that with the projection on the surface of the rubber, what those other people's bodies are really doing are just sort of adding in the the kind of colour, the blood if you like, into these white forms. But all the detail, you know, the texture of the skin or the lines or whatever, are all provided by my body, which is a kind of host if you like. So when you first walk into the room, my idea was that you'd come into a dark room, you'd hear this breathing, and you'd see a figure lying on the ground that, as, as if there really was a person in the room lying there, like a, as if it was a live performance suddenly that figure would move away from you. It would roll away from you and leave behind this kind of physical memory of itself and then roll into this other figure. So that was my first thought about that work. It's a spooky work, but it's also a work, I think, that is um, quite transformative. It's about change and that restless thing that you talked about, I guess, is completely evident in that work. It's always on the move. And um, the forms that lie there are, really are like these I, you know, I call them hosts. It was a word that came to me after I saw the piece happening. Um, and I guess, you know, maybe it's very resonant. If you, if you see somebody who's died, a, a person who one second before was alive, once, you know, the, the last breath's gone out of somebody, it's completely evident that they're not here anymore. And yet you've got this form that has all the residue of what you remember of somebody, but you absolutely know they're not there. It's not inhabited anymore. And I think why people respond to that work is I think we've all had that experience. We know what that feeling is. And it's very, it's very moving and unnerving at the same time because it's gonna to happen to us, obviously. But um, I think that's what that work evokes because um, there's an aliveness to those young bodies moving. You know, it's kind of beautiful in one sense, but then there's this other form left behind. So. Maybe one of the reasons why I work across so many materials, but I work with a very um, constant type of subject matter, the way I keep innovating it for myself is again being restless with materials because when you do that, you're always in this zone of uncertainty, you know, of doubt. It may not work. Maybe you won't get on top of the technology in this case, or maybe the materials will defeat you in some way. So I think or I would hope that a lot of the works get charged with that and it stops them becoming too static, even when often they're static forms. This 
piece here is called a razor head. That's six heads that are just from a mould that I did a cast of myself, which was a pretty excruciating process, I have to say. So it does look pretty agonised. Um, but they're all exactly the same. They're made with silicon rubber and silica flour. What the idea was for them that they are what their title suggests are razor heads. They're like giant razors in the shape of my head, or erasers, that I can rub out with. What I did with these heads was, having made them into big rubbers or bigger razors, um, was to use them, as you can see in the video, to rub against some big photographs I made. Now the photographs were, like a lot of my work, it looks simple but quite complicated process. Um, I used some images which um, are connected to another work here called Soft Targets. Um, and from those works, I had them printed just not roughly, but not as really on high quality paper. I covered all the image with graphite. Um, and then, as you can see in the video, I did a sort of performance work that we recorded, making the video really more like a documentary or a mockumentary, as I say, of that process. Um, so I'm just using these heads, all the black marks on them are just basically the graphite that's come off from the rubbing on the works. Now, obviously this work's got all sorts of meanings that I'm not trying to go into, but one of the things that prompted, when I was, because I've worked with a figure for so long, um, I've looked at all sorts of other artists across the, across the history of art who've worked with the, the figure, mostly the female figure, obviously. And I'd sort of got up to this point where I was looking at people like um, um, William de Kooning and the way he'd work with the figure and also um, Rosenberg. And Rosenberg did a really amusing work in which he asked um, um, de Kooning, who was, if you like, like the star of the time, like the famous artist, and de Kooning was a very, uh, sorry, Rosenberg was a young artist, and he approached de Kooning as the master and asked him if he would give him a drawing of his, and Amazingly, de Kooning agreed. I guess he wanted to make a connection to the younger generation. And what Rosenberg did was to erase that drawing and show it as his piece of work. So in a sense, this whole work is a kind of um, a nod in that direction. And it's like, you know, if de Kooning could hand it over to Rosenberg, then why couldn't Julie Rapp herself? take up the mantle of that if you like. So there's a, again, across a lot of my work I like to feel there's a sort of humour running through it too. The video is meant to be quite humorous, it's not edited to be a video which has got a narrative or is a kind of art video in that sense. It's functioning almost like in a kind of 70s way as a sort of document of a performance. Um, so, you know, you can see me kind of talking off camera to the person shooting it. Some of the angles are really strange and so it's meant to have that kind of casual quality to it. So we don't really need to say who this is. It's me. <laughs> no, it's me as Marilyn Monroe. Um, the amusing thing, I see this as a quite Duchampian work in a way because on the one hand we've got this glass pattern. I went to a tailor and I took him a picture of Marilyn Monroe in her white dress and I said, could you make a pattern for me of that dress, which he did. And I took that pattern to a glass maker and or cutter and he made that exact pattern but in glass with all the measure, you know, with all the little sort of bits on it that a pattern maker would know how to make a dress from. I'm not a very good dressmaker, but I always thought the shapes were really intriguing. But in a sense, what's happening in this work is that the dress, the famous white dress, which has now become a kind of glass dress, doesn't really exist. It exists in your mind because you've got the pattern which could make the dress and you've got the model, me as Marilyn, wearing the dress, but the dress has never been made, obviously. It's just constructed three-dimensionally on a computer program. So a lot of people when I showed this work thought I'd actually had that made and I was wearing it, which is pretty funny. Um, but of course I'm not, it's constructed. So the dress happens in your own imagination. Here's the elements for it, the model's telling you what it would look like if you made it, and here's the pattern to guide you to make it, but it doesn't actually exist. So it's sort of like an impossible achievement. And obviously I also did it as a, a glass dress, apart from the fact it's both stiff and breakable all at the same time. But also you can see through it and you, and you know the whole thing of that 
the 50s was the dresses blowing up and it's oh you know you might see a little bit of her panties um, but here you get to see you know the uh, the sort of 50s kind of daggy white pants so it's, you know that's what it's all about so the title of this works rise and fall which um, in a sense and I often quite like to just be really literal about it, not be metaphorical about it, um, the choose rise and fall. Um, but also, rise and fall is like, I thought about, you know, empires rise and fall, you know, it's like the kind of grand monumental thing. But it was just more this simple thought of how could I make some, how could I make shoes move um, so they were in a certain sense felt occupied by a body but they weren't and it was quite a technically difficult work because at first we were going to use magnets and so on but anyway finally we worked out how to do it on the monitor is this picture of a, or a video that's looped of a friend of mine a man trying to stand on his toes and if you watch the video you can see there's a quite a bit of strain of trying to maintain this pose so He's trying to stand on his toes without the aid of these shoes. But meanwhile, he's kind of the master of the situation because as he spins, he directs the shoes to move. And I guess I didn't, <clears throat> this wasn't like I had any big comment to make about ballerinas or anything like that. It's just one of those works that's a bit visceral. It, it's one of those things where I had this idea. I mean, body doubles a very different example of that, but something which had its own kind of presence if you like. And I think, you know, there's something very delicate and evocative about ballet shoes. It's the colour, it's the material, and the fact that they keep dancing, even in these sort of really difficult situation, and they're being sort of, um, in a way, kind of, there's a demand on them to keep going. So it's not, a, it's not a work that I really try to make big statements about. I think, again, it just is what it is. And I think it affects audiences in that way too, you know, because they make this banging noise and, and they're kind of, often people found it humorous because they go and sort of jump up again and so on. And it's a kind of, maybe what it's, there's a sort of futility to this work, which I think makes it have this very human sort of element. Um, and there's pathos to it, I guess, because the shoes go on dancing when there's no one here to occupy them anymore. This work's called Transpositions. Um, but I often just call it the wooden faces um, as my sort of pet name for it. But basically what I did, it's quite, a, again, it's quite simple sort of work. I, it, it started because I was invited into the Biennale of Sydney back in, I think it was 88. And um, I did, I had some work in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, the classic sort of museum. But I also was asked to do a piece at the wharf. And it's, because it's on the wharf, it's a pier, it's got a lot of, big wooden beams supporting the building. And I had this idea that I would take five beams running in parallel to one another so that if you sense if you put a string around it, you'd make an imaginary room. And then on those beams, I put 10 rows of these women's faces and I printed them in wood to go up the beams. So they became like a support for the structure. And that was the sort of, if you like, the installation idea for it. But I do also show it in, obviously now, in this configuration. But the criteria for that work was to find, to source across history, right up to the point of representation when it became more abstract, a hundred faces of women that are looking out at you. And that wasn't such an easy thing to find a hundred of them because in many paintings, as we know across time, the, the female didn't look directly out at the viewer. It was probably seen as not a very demure thing to do, as for, you know, so there's a lot of reasons for it. But anyway, I found a hundred that did. And the idea was there, I'm not in this, by the way, it's not a, a work that, was, that I'm in, obviously. But they're like, I call them like my little phalanx, my little army of women that come out and sort of occupy the space. I think the fact it's on wood, it's kind of got this warmth to it, this piece, just at a physical level, I think it's, and it's very benign. It's just a, um, a work that's not aggressive in any sense, but it's quite demanding, I think, if you think about a hundred faces looking at you. The title of this work is Porous Bodies, which suggests that a body, if you think about skin, it's a kind of, it's an outer covering, um, which sort of, I guess, contains everything within, but it's a porous surface, as we know. So I've, I've used that idea as, of skin as porous as a metaphor for the whole sense of the body of being porous. I mean, we absorb things, we emit things. Um, porous Bodies was a show that I made um, not long after the death of my father. So it's quite a, um, it's a show that has 
means a lot to me, I guess, or, or a series of works that means a lot to me. Um, I had um, an exhibition organised, but I have to say, you know, when he died, um, I didn't, you know, the, making art seemed like a fairly activity that wasn't that important, really. But nevertheless, in a funny sense, in that state of mind, my observational capacities became quite heightened. None of the photographs that go with this series were dropped down from the videos. They were all shot separately. And the idea for that was, in a sense, there, a lot of them are kind of more idealised, if you like. Um, they're on, some of them are on the edge of almost being like a piece of advertising gone wrong. Um, a lot of them are shot with sort of underlighting through opaque perspex. Uh, for example, the cow tongue tie, you know, I set it up really pristinely with this cow tongue. And there's, that creates a contrast between a kind of, an image that is a bit disturbing or a bit, you, it, it looks like one thing and becomes another. But what the videos do, I think, is create this very organic relationship. It makes the image move. So, as with honey ants, the photo is one thing, the video is another because you see all the ants milling um, around it. And I think there's a sense of decay. I would say that this show has got this whole crossover between something erotic and something dead or decaying, which sounds a bit macabre, but I really do think when something very powerful happens to you, in my case it was losing my father, it's almost like um, little things can matter as much as big things and, and I, I don't know why but I just launched off after this honey ants work and let my mind go where it wanted to and I often see these series of videos like little haikus in a way, they're just little thoughts that I then didn't ask a lot of questions about, I just start to make them so I think it's a work, a lot of people have responded to this work, I, I, I mean it's hard to know why but I think it's just um, I think there's a lightness to it, even though it may appear to be dealing with quite um, disturbing subject matter. I think there's a lightness in it, and I think that's what people respond to. And there's also humour. Like the horse's tail, why would I think of that? But I did. Um, but I just had this sort of, which often happens to me, just an image comes to mind. And in this instance, it was just this idea of a, you know, a, a woman's um, bottom with a horse's tail coming out of it, which is a sort of, I guess, an erotic image, but it's also just a kind of quite surreal image. It's a quirky image. And then I thought, well, what would be amazing to have with that is a video where I just go and shoot a horse's tail. And I, I did that, and I thought the shot of it was very funny because the horse is just flicking its tail to get rid of flies. I mean, flies seems to be a topic in this show for some reason. But, um, you know, and then the, when you look at the horse's tail, it's so suggestive and erotic that it it bounces off this photograph and has a conversation with it which suddenly detonates a whole lot of thoughts about this photograph. So um, that's how the videos and the photographs work together. So these two works are called Hardcore, Softcore. Um, I guess Softcore suggests the soft core, you know, the vulnerable, and Hardcore, you know, I mean it's a term that you could use in pornography too. So it's just a play off two things. The deep intention of the work is to create, the, because of the rubber's got such a flexible nature and because the cast is directly from me, is so realistic that it's actually a bit spooky. It's almost like a real body that's just had all the blood drained out of it. And the way I've put them in the um, bronze forms, which are static, they can't move, they're completely rigid in those shapes is as a counterpoint because the rubber feels almost fleshy as in relation to the stiffness of the of the bronze so they're very physical works they're not they're not works that you know you need to go on explaining really they're meant to be felt by the viewer i think a lot of people have an idea of art as being this very linear thing but in fact um, you're speaking across time with work you might be thinking of something from 10 or 15 years ago when you were actually conceiving something new. So as it emanates all from the one person, it's understandable. Like memories, you know, memories don't just, it's not like you forget those ones and move forward into the new ones. They kind of jostle around in your mind and some things from long ago come into prominence because something else triggers them. And so I think that's probably a better way to think about a practice. It's a practice, you know, it's not, 
It's not like this neat little series of artworks that one produces. Not every work in this, but the vast majority of this series are absolute um, re-performances, if you like, of Munch works. Um, the one I'm standing to, next to here is called The Morning After and it's on, one, on its side and I've made it vertical. Um, the technique with all the different gridded areas, um, that wasn't put together arbitrarily. What I did was do a drawing outline from Munch's work and I gridded it up and then like a big backdrop with this gridded area on it, I stood in the picture and really literally the camera just took that part of me and then it took another part and another part. So all these grids actually represent different negatives. And so then I printed all those up and put them all back together again and then painted them. But when I put them back together again, it's not so clear in this one, but it's probably more clear in this one here. What, I've, what I sort of, the discussion with myself was that you can't change history. The images are there. Um, so the outline from history I kept complete because I couldn't really change it. And because in reassembling the image with that logic to keep the Mook image intact, it had this effect of breaking up and fragmenting my form. So these works weren't put together because I thought, hey, that would look pretty groovy if I, you know, had this broken sort of figure of myself. It was almost like a set of rules. In assembling this, it just had this effect of breaking my form. After I'd painted them, these are facsimile works, meaning I made these images, these big montages, to this size. And then I re-photographed them, and then I destroyed the original works, the so-called original works, and then showed them only ever as photographs. And that was in, obviously very intentional because I wasn't trying to do a kind of painting exercise in that sense. I was trying to step back a bit and in a way sort of make a commentary about it. So even though they, I think they read as very, if you like, sensuous expressions, whatever, they're actually quite second degree about that. They're a step back. Um, and as I've sort of spoken about in other works, I often deal, it's not, a, it's not the whole subject of my work is not about that kind of expressing of the self. Um, it's a step back from that. So this work's called Vital Statistics, which is a kind of, it was a work that when I was living in Europe, I was trying to make this work for a long time and um, I couldn't sort of solve how to do it. I tried it with plaster and it didn't quite work. And I always knew that what I wanted to do was to record sculpturally the spaces between the arms and the legs. Um, because in a certain sense, I'm, I'm casting what isn't there you know, a sort of female response to the Vitruvian man, the perfect sort of um, proportions, if you like. But they're also, it's a kind of performative work. I mean, the viewer can't hop into it, but they're on these, actually on these stands, a bit like mannequins, um, where the stands could actually be moved up and down to fit somebody else's height, if you like. But the photographs, in a certain sense, are like demonstrations of when I hopped into these objects, when I got back into them again and, and was photographed, they had this, because part of me sunk into the negative form, I got this very attenuated, thin sort of quality, you know, so it's like a kind of, um, it's taking the idea of, you know, the perfect, the vital statistics to some sort of extreme. And one of the reasons why these photos, I've kind of bleached, not bleached them out with any, I've just taken ones that were a little bit more overexposed, because I actually quite like the idea that you could have don't, the first thing you don't see are the objects in them, that I'm obviously just back in these objects. I like the idea of thinking that this is what the objects do to the figure, that it becomes like these funny, sort of spindly types of characters. So, um, so they are performances in the objects, but they have their own kind of existence as well. This work, um, Overstepping, which, yes, has become a kind of signature work, and I, I don't know why, you know, why do those thoughts occur to you, but that work of Magritte's came into my mind, and then I suddenly thought, with the way that one can manipulate photographs now, maybe I can make a high heel foot, a foot with a high heel. So it was just, 
as simple as that. And then it was just a question of how to go about that and achieve it. And that wasn't that complex. I mean, it was technically complex for the people who did it for me under my instruction. Because it was crucial that it got, it was as real as we possibly ke could get. Because otherwise it would just be corny, it wouldn't work at all. Um, and I think they did a fantastic job with it. In the year 2000, the preceding year, I did do a show called Amour, where I took about 10 I asked actually a lot of girlfriends of mine, who's your favourite sort of film star or film that you... But anyway, I came up with about 10 people, of which Marilyn Monroe was one. And again, not, I didn't just... I performed these poses, some of them quite well known, but then with um, Photoshop and so on and 3D manipulation and so on, I changed them. They, they, they still look like the pose and there's a little bit of glamour still there but they've been altered so one's got a lot of hair on her or one's got horses hooves or whatever. So I guess perhaps this idea of overstepping popped into my mind so easily because I'd already been in the zone if you like with those other works and playing around and having a lot of fun with it. I mean there's, it's meant to be quite, I mean I find this work quite humorous myself. Um, and, and with the other works from Amour, you know, like the idea of Raquel Welsh, me, well, one, me as Raquel Welsh is quite a leap, but anyway. And, you know, I made this furry bikini out of, I went down King Street, Newtown, and got this horrible old kangaroo skin coat, which I cut up, and I must say, it must have, you know, it was so old that when I had it on, it was really itchy. So there was, when I was shooting, it was like fun, it's like dress-up time. I guess from the title Amour, which is like Amour is love in French and Armour in English and so it's like a, a, a sort of play on words about those two things so in a sense I guess if you put them together you could talk about it as a sort of love armour or something like that and um, I guess this work epitomises it's from a film called In the Realm of the Senses and the character's called Eco or the actress is called Eco and there's this amazing scene where she's crawling across the bed with a knife in her mouth because in this film she um, cuts off the genitals of her lover. Um, and it's an image that um, when I made it, I actually was quite a complex image to make because I had my own face done with a, a, in a place called New Dawn where they actually technically film, they do it in increments so that when you put it on the computer and build it up again from that model, you actually get all your own features because we didn't just kind of put it in with Photoshop, we actually mapped all that metal to, so that my features remained exactly the same, but they were becoming metal. And the idea is it's just this sense of the knife is kind of sort of extending into her face, that she's turning into the thing that she's carrying in her mouth. She's going through this strange, if you like, psychological transformation to do this act and we've just caught her on the verge. So on the one hand we're seeing something very real, on the other hand it's a kind of imaginative space of what might be going on in her mind. So um, she's armouring herself, if you like, to perform what in the film is seen as an act of love. Yes, she's the armour. In some cases the works in a moor, like the Raquel Welsh or Marilyn, are almost um, stereotypes that haven't really escaped their stereotype for most people whereas I think these ones are kind of much more complex characters you know the Catherine Deneuve of Repulsion or Eco from In the Realm of the Senses or this one here you know in a way I guess they're not stereotypes that um, people would want to base themselves on necessarily so I think that's quite good you know it, it sets aside between these kind of more flashy glamour stereotypes to these more moody, uncertain ideas. So the whole of Amour plays between that, so love, armour. <laughs> this is a work that's in different forms. It's, it's 160 people that I photographed both in Europe and Australia posing as the Mona Lisa. And when I first um, made it, the idea was I printed all the portraits on glass and behind them is a sort of uh, half black, half white painting. And, um, and I just simply asked them to pose as the Mona Lisa. It's the kind of watching work or the witnessing work in this whole exhibition because there's all these other, you know, things moving, bodies sort of rotating or, you know, whatever it is. And they just are there in this kind of very iconic, classical sense over and over again performing the Mona Lisa like some kind of signature things.
Well, the work at the very end of this long space is called Prosthetic Night and it's a spinning work. It was quite near the end of the process um, when we were actually turning it as we were sanding it and I suddenly thought, this work's got to turn. It can't, I, I hadn't thought about that before. I was just making this idea of this, this embrace that I would sort of trap as a negative. And so we, you know, so that's what we did and I got a little motor on it so it would spin. But when I got it back to my studio and for the first time made it spin, I was absolutely caught unawares by the fact that the figure, because with the play of light on it, it reads like, at certain points it reads like a positive figure. And if you watch that figure as it spins, at a certain point it appears as if the figure's spinning in the wrong direction to what the object is doing. And I thought that was like the secret part of the work that even I couldn't control. And it was like the work escaped me in a sense. I think it's quite good to see these works as resistant to me too, because I'm in this kind of, if you like, I'm the body double, I'm in two places at once. I'm the artist being, you know, willful and insisting a work should be a certain way. And I think that's, um, you know, even in hairline crack that's down there, where I put all the hair in the tubes, I had this idea that it would all stay in the tubes and when I put the perspex together, it all pulled out. And it's like that funny thing where you're thinking, no, that's not my idea, it has to look like this. And then the work does its own thing. And in a sense, it has to. And that makes the work become, you know, th that's the end, if you like, of the works. When you've worked for 25 or 30 years, you've got a lot of work. You're attached to all of those works as an artist in one form or another. But then in a certain sense, to have to edit down like that is a great process because it means in lots of ways you can choose some of the works that you think really came together fantastically and also how those works have a conversation with one another. So it's been a really interesting exercise and um, I think as you move through this show you do get a sense that work has happened over a very long period of time and even though there's only a certain percent of examples of that, that that work has quite a deep sort of um, core to it, if you like, um, like a kind of well that comes up, that sort of brings things up to the surface. I think that is one of the great opportunities that um, an artist, if it's possible to happen for them when they've worked for a long time, I also think that's very rewarding for an audience. I mean, when you see a survey, a survey show by one artist, you really, I think, get you really get into the mind of that person, the imagination of that person. And um, I feel in this show, that's how people that I've spoken to have reacted to it. For some people, it's like, oh, I remember that work from 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's also, it seems sort of resonated in people's minds in that way too. But for me also, it's fantastic to sort of have all these works in dialogue with one another. And so I would hope in the choices that we've created a sort of mapped out the sort of fairly wide field, certainly of materials that I work in and um, I guess enriched people's understanding of what I do.